Hello, my name is Kate Baldwin, and I'm going to explain PCR using this tactile model, which you can download from my website, k8baldwin.com, on the downloads page. And then you can cut it out and tape it together, and you can have one too. PCR is an incredibly useful molecular biology technique. It's used nearly daily in biochemistry labs, genetics labs, cell biology labs, and more. But you might have also heard of it in crime scene investigation, because PCR is used to tell if the drop of blood found at the crime scene matches the suspect. Uh, it's also used in paternity tests, um, and there's many different variations on PCR, but I'm just going to explain the basic concept today. So uh, PCR is able to take a small amount of starting material DNA and make many copies of the DNA. So it's kind of like a Xerox machine for DNA. And it's even better than that because you're able to make many copies of just the gene that you, the scientist, are interested in. So for example, at a crime scene, you've got a drop of blood that would contain the entire genome of the murderer. So uh, thousands and thousands of genes. You're really only interested in a couple of genes that have been established as markers for individual identity. So you can use PCR to make many, many millions of copies of just the gene that you are interested in. And then you can analyze it. So you're able to start with a minute amount of starting material, and at the end of PCR, you have enough material to actually work with and identify the murderer. So uh, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase is the name of the enzyme that does all the work in PCR, and chain reaction refers to how on each cycle you double the amount of material that you have. Uh, so like a geometric increase in the amount of, of uh, product, like two rabbits on an island. It only takes a few generations to have thousands of rabbits on the island. Let's talk about the materials that we need to do PCR. So the first thing we need is template DNA. So this is the DNA that is the starting material. So this would be the drop of blood from the crime scene or the first piece of paper that you put in the Xerox machine that you're going to make a bunch of copies of. So this is a, a critical part of PCR. And uh, in our paper model, um, we're showing the DNA double helix untwisted to make it flat, to make it easier to make a model of it. But imagine that it's twisted, twisted up, you know, like kind of like that. And also imagine that it's much longer than it is. So if this were genomic DNA, it would be thousands and thousands and thousands of base pairs long. So it would be much longer in this direction and much longer in that direction. But you know you only want to cut out so much paper. So just use your imagination for that part. Um, and so the DNA is made up of the two backbones, um, which are shown in green here. And then there's uh, the base pairs. So A is always with T in the base pairs, and G is always with C in the base pairs. Um, so there's our DNA. The second thing that we need for PCR are primers. So primers are provided by the scientist, and there are usually two different primers in each PCR reaction. They're both made of single-stranded DNA, but they have different sequence. So the scientist gets to choose the sequence of these primers, and they're ordered from a facility that would generate them chemically. Um, and they are usually 20 bases long, not four. but Again, you only want to cut out so much paper, so use your imagination and pretend that the primers are 20 base pairs long. Um, and it is the sequence that the scientist chooses for the primers that is going to determine which gene we make millions of copies of. So these are very important. The next thing we need for PCR are the actual building block material that DNA is made out of. So um, these are shown as little piece of paper beads, and they're called DNTPs, um, which is for deoxynucleotide triphosphates. And so there's Cs, Ts, okay, there's a G. The other thing we're going to need is the enzyme to actually do the work. So in our model, that's my hands. So this is the polymerase enzymes right here that are going to be in our PCR re reaction. The other thing we need is a happy buffered environment that the enzyme can act in. So it's got to have a nice pH for the enzyme. It's got to have some magnesium ions. So I guess in our analogy, that's kind of like my living room 
Now we are inside the microfuge tube that we're going to use for the PCR reaction. So we have our template DNA. We have our primers with the sequence designed to target our gene of interest. We have our DNTPs and we have our polymerase enzymes. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands of DNA. So that's called denaturing the DNA uh, or melting the DNA apart. So in a living cell, when DNA needs to replicate, there are dozens of enzymes that together pull the DNA apart. Well, we're doing DNA replication in a test tube, so we don't want to have to put dozens of enzymes in there. We're going to use physical means. So we're going to heat up our entire reaction tube to 95 degrees Celsius. So that's nearly boiling. And that very high temperature will force the two very long strands of template DNA apart from each other. The second step in PCR, we're going to lower the temperature slightly. It's still going to be warm, about 55 degrees Celsius, so still quite warm. But it's cool enough that short strands of DNA can now begin to stick to each other. So the primers, which have the certain sequence that, that we chose to target our gene, will find the place in the genome where they match. Now, as I said before, real primers are 20 base pairs long, not four, but use your imagination. So at 55 degrees, the primers will go and find the place that they're supposed to stick. Now for our third step of PCR, we're going to do a temperature where the enzyme is active, which in this case is 72 degrees Celsius, which is still quite warm. And we'll explain why this particular enzyme likes such warm temperatures later. So now at 72 degrees, the polymerase enzyme will actively start to build DNA. Now DNA can only be DNA polymerase enzymes can only build DNA if they start from an existing piece of DNA, like the primer. They can't just start building DNA out of nowhere. They have to extend an existing piece. And DNA can uh, has two different sides to it. The five prime end is the over here, and the three prime end is over here. DNA can only grow on its three prime end. That's just kind of a rule of the chemistry of this molecule. So here at 72 degrees, our polymerase enzyme will start building the DNA, matching base for base each piece. There are times when you must come. We have just doubled the amount of DNA for this gene that we started with. We used to have just two single strands of it. Now we have four of them. So that completes the first cycle of the PCR reaction. So now we go for cycle two. So once again, we heat up the temperature to 95 degrees, which will separate the DNA strands from each other starts start to run out of room a little bit here but there we are so again now we're going to go down to 55 degrees again so once more these uh another set of primers we put a lot in the reaction another set of primers will come over and stick but this time not only can primers stick to the original template dna but they can also stick to our new DNA that we just made in cycle number one. Now we're ready to go down to, or up to 72 degrees again, so that the enzyme can start building the DNA again. now we have completed our second round of PCR so we now have four uh, double-stranded copies of the gene 
whereas at the beginning we started out with just one. So each cycle it'll double. Uh, so 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. After 30 cycles you've got millions of copies and eventually the uh, length that will dominate the product will be a product that starts at where the primer one began and ends at where the primer two began. So you will essentially wind up with millions of copies of DNA that are exactly the same length and that's the length that is the distance between your two primers. So in this example that's only 12 base pairs but a typical PCR reaction you're talking hundreds to thousands of base pairs normally. So I want to address an interesting thing you might have noticed there. So we were heating the entire reaction mixture to 95 degrees uh, for a little bit during every cycle. So that's boiling temperatures. That's very hot and that would destroy most proteins. And the polymerase enzymes, my hands, are made of protein. And you can imagine that a normal protein, when you boil it, would fall apart and, and break. So how do the polymerase enzymes in a PCR reaction survive? Well, it's actually a really clever solution. So instead of using a DNA polymerase from a normal organism, we use one from an extremophile. So an extremophile is an organism that lives in a very extreme environment, in this case a super hot environment. So the typical polymerase used for PCR comes from a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus and it lives in the uh, super hot geyser pools at Yellowstone. So this is an organism specially adapted to living at really hot temperatures. So its favorite temperature to live at is 72 degrees Celsius, which is way too hot for us to live at. Um, but its proteins have all become adapted to be very heat stable, including its DNA replication enzyme, DNA polymerase. Uh, bacteria lives at 70 degrees, the enzyme can still keep it together even at 95 degrees for short periods of time. So if we use DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus, it's able to survive the full 30 cycles of the reaction to continue making more DNA. I invite you to download your own copy of the paper PCR model that I designed on the website at k8baldwin.com. Cut it out. It does take a long time to cut out. Tape it together, and then you can go forth and teach PCR to others. Thank you.